All right, let's. We've got another caller on, so we'll go ahead and take that call now. Uh, caller, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Uh, hello, my name is Ahmed. Uh, I'm calling from Florida. Oh, very good. Um, I'm just. I just have a, uh, one question uh, about the word Ichad and Elohim. Um, now, the word Ichad, which is uh, can, um, coincidentally, it's the same in the Arabic, which is Ahad. It means you know God is one and. Uh, He's only one. You can't you can't add. You can't subtract. Nothing. Okay. He's only one God. But the Christians uh, would say that Echad means a complex unity, or, or a compound unity, meaning that God has uh, more than one person, or He's like a group. And they would also say that Elohim is plural, and um, uh, Elohim is plural, and they would point to the Trinity, to, to that and claim that. God is a trinity. So how can you respond to that? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Okay. Are you a Muslim, by the way? Yeah. So this, uh, for Muslims, can be very, um, very tricky uh, because the Muslim Muslims worship one God. And there is nothing more central to the Islamic faith, like the Jewish faith, that there is one God and no other. La ilaha illallah. That's the most central core creed of, of Muslims worldwide. Nothing is more central. Now, Christians play a game. It's a rather ugly game, and I'll explain to you. Because I want people, the worldwide, to understand what's being done. Very dangerous game that's being played, and I want to explain to you how to respond. So what Christians argue, and they argue it uh, very frequently, is in the Torah it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is a God, the Lord is one. Well, I don't know of anything that could be more clear. There is one God, and worship only one God, one alone. So for this reason... Jewish people pronounce, say this, Shema Yisrael, Adi Noi Eliheinu, Adi Noi Echad, Hero Israel, the Lord is a God, the Lord is one. We say it every time, and it must be at the forefront of a Jew every single day. He must bear witness to this. It's so important, it's a commandment for every Jew to recite this creed in every morning, every night. It's the first words that every Jew learns as a child, when he turns 120 or she's 120, the last words that a Jew recites before he stands before God, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekein Hashem Echad. So we ask the Christian who, Christians who believe in the doctrine of the Trinity and seek to question what seems so obvious and that is, and this is the argument, I want to make this clear, I don't want to misrepresent Christianity or well, Christian apologists because they're asking a question, and if you don't know what's coming, you're going to get tripped up fast. Religious Jews, of course, because we read the Torah in its original language all day, Right? The Torah should not leave your lips. This is a commandment. And you should study a day and night. Jews are, are not, but other people of, of our cousins um, who, um, who, who, who believe, I mean, who believe that there is one God. It's called Tawheed. The word Tawheed is not in the Quran, but it means a absolute oneness of God, a absolute Unitarian uh, concept of God, and there is no other. And in Islam, in the Quran, uh, there is grave warnings to those who dare worship a messenger as God, who dare worship, I don't know, Mary, who is extolled in the Quran, who worship anything but God. I mean, you'll find criticism of the Jews, but Christianity is really um, gets it, gets it theologically really hard, get punished very quickly. Now, this is the way. First, I want to explain the argument of Christians to try to trip up 
Muslims. They don't do it as much with Jews, religious Jews like me. Why? Because they know it won't work. We laugh at this. But, I, but as it turns out, let's face it, most of our cousins were family are not really reading Tyra. And, or Jews who, I don't know, have a, a, a poor education, don't even have a Hebrew scholar, they also will find this confusing. And this is the Christian argument. I want to explain it slowly. First, I want to just give you the full Christian argument for those who do not understand the question. And then I want to show you how, how f that this is completely bogus. This is a fatuous argument. And, and Christians who... Now, I, I, I'm hoping to God that most Christians don't realize the blasphemy that they say, that they are committing by making such a statement. I, and, I, and those who do, I pray that they will repent. But I first need to explain to you. So what many Christians who seek to convert uh, monotheists, true monotheists, not fake monotheists, so they will point to passages in the Bible where it which seem to imply that the word echad, which means one, like it is, it's not a complicated word. It's not like woo woo word. It's echad, and by the way, in Arabic, it's the same word. I mean, it's pronounced, you know, it's, like, it's the same word. So what Christians will argue is, oh, God, not so fast, because at, this, they they literally say this without blanching. And the Christians who do this professionally, it's a, I, don't, I, I don't know. I mean, do, are they really sincere or do they know they're lying? I don't know. The heart only God knows, so I won't make the comment. But this is a complete lie. But first I will present what they argue. So they'll say, ha, 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 at first glance seems to mean one. But they will say, echad really means a complex unity. It doesn't mean one alone. And in fact, there's another word for that, is yachid, it means alone. And they'll prove it. And this is one of those arguments that at first glance seems, um, seems um, compelling. But what you do is you have to take, just dig a little deeper, just a drop deeper, and then you realize that this is a that this is a fatuous claim, and it is also blasphemy against the God of, of Avram Avinu, Yitzhak Avinu, Yaakov Avinu, Daniel of blessed memory. But here's their argument. For example, if you go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, I'm just going to give you, I'm just going to argue it the way Christians would. What does it say? There, by he er, by he by care. It was evening, it was morning. I'm echad, one day. So we see that one doesn't really mean one as you Jews claim or as you Muslims claim. Here we see it's a complex unity. It's multiple things in one. Or as we see in the Bible, Adam is instructed, our first father is instructed, the man should leave his 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 family's house and should cleave unto his wife and they should become basar echad. They should become one flesh. Ah! We have here an open proof that echad doesn't mean one alone and no other. The word ta'wid, by the way, is an Arabic word which simply describes absolute monotheism as Jews believe, okay? The word ta'wid, just as a point, is a concept. It's like Unitarianism. It does not appear in the Quran itself, but it's a concept. A concept of, because uh, Muslims had to come up with a, the, a word that, um, that conveys the, mono, the absolute monotheism of Islam and Judaism in contradistinction to Christianity. And this is a very, very excellent, it's really an excellent word to do that. But it's not a word found in the Quran. And don't let Christians, oh, Tawid's not in the Quran. Well, Trinity is not in the New Testament either. Don't, you have to be careful because if, if you're not ready for these arguments, it really will, um, it'll throw you off. Let me give you another example. I really want to lay it out. I'm going to even make it stronger. We see, for instance, Numbers chapter 13, verse 23, that when the spies returned back from Canaan, 
and they came back with one cluster of grapes. Now, so you have many grapes in one cluster. The, the context is that these were huge grapes, and the ten spies who were unfaithful uh, were showing that this land is unconquerable. Look at what's coming out of here, okay? But the point that is being argued by our... I don't want to say our Christian friends. Uh, there are some who are innocent, who don't know any better, but the apologists who argue this, that means the people with degrees, they know, I'm pretty sure they know exactly what they're doing. So that is the argument. So the argument is, and they will say this, you'll say the following, the word echad, if you look it up in the Jewish Bible anywhere, it really means a complex unity and does not mean one alone. Okay? Now, anyone who's ever heard this, whether you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew, you know that I have not misrepresented the Christian argument here. And this, this argument is blasphemy, it is a lie, it is fatuous, and it's completely bogus. Because what they're doing is they're creating what's called in logic a complex equation. They're saying that everywhere the word achat appears means a complex unity kind of one. And therefore, when it says hero is the Lord our God is one, it means complex unity, hence the Trinity. And this is an absolute lie. But what did they do? It's very simple. And I'll explain more in a moment. First, let me tell you what they do. And that is that, in fact, the word achad appears all over the Jewish Bible. Sometimes it does mean a, co a complex unity, just like in English. Let's just use English. One. Okay? Well, one in English can either mean there was one smile, or I had one thought, or it can mean... I have a, a, a living room, one living room set, which comprises tables and chairs. It's the same thing, but what do they do? They cherry pick only the examples in the Jewish Bible where Achad is a complex unity, and then they, and they ignore, they extract, they surgically remove. They won't tell you all the places in the Jewish Bible where the word echad means one and no other, and they won't tell you. And the, God forbid, will bring someone to idolatry. And I'll give you many examples which no missionary will share with you. Maybe I am hoping that these missionaries are ignorant, but believe me, many of them are not. I've been doing this 35 years. Cool. So let's take an example, and I'll show you this is a complete lie. Because it really, this is no big woo-woo mystery here. It's just like in English. For example, the Torah says, take a moment, open up Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. I'm going to actually give you a second, because I want you to look inside. Your, li your eternal life is at stake. Okay, so go to Deuteronomy 17, verse 6. Take a moment, look at it, because right now, if you're a Christian, is the time to repent. And I say it out of love. If I didn't care about you, I say, go worship your idols. Go desecrate your soul. But I, I care about you, believe me. And one thing I say to the B'nai Yitzhak and B'nai Yishmael, to the Jews and Muslims, I, I teach you this. There are some really bad characters out there who do this, but my sense is that most Christians just really don't know any better. So if, they, if your sense is they don't know any better, no matter what, be nice, okay? I'm, it, it offends me. It does. I mean, to say this to a Jew that there's more than one God, when Isaiah screams, there is no one else besides me, there's no one before me, there's no one after me, Atem Eidainum Hashem, Abdi Hashem Bechar to you, my witnesses declares the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen, verse 11 of Isaiah 43, Anoichi, I even I am the Lord, and besides me there is no other Savior. Really, if tonight you want to accept the Hashakadish Baruch of the true Holy God, read Deuteronomy 4. I'm not even saying a word. Read it and repent. If you're if you're not a a true monotheist, that means a complete unitarian. 
now that you have Deuteronomy 17.6, because I, you have to see it. I mean, this is a very serious charge that Christians are making against the Jewish Bible. And if they are right, if they are wrong, then they're the priests of Baal. Watch. The Torah says, now the context, you know I'm not taking anything out of context, Deuteronomy 17 is about Jewish law, and frankly, the law of, of witnesses. That means, if, if let's say someone commits a crime, a crime, well, you need evidence in order to indict. Well, what is that standard of evidence? Well, we want witnesses. I'm not going to go complicated here, just really simple. You need witnesses. And, you know, you can't put people to death on some... It's very, there is a death penalty, but <laughs> it's, it's a very, very high standard. So the Torah says, I want to read to you this verse. I want you to read it with me, and I want you to fall to your feet and accept the God, the God of Avram Yitzchak Yaakov in your life. Please. We're all prophets to Jews and Muslims. The Torah says these words, Al pi shnayim edim, oy shloishim edim, yumas hames, which means, upon the testimony of two or three witnesses, a person can be executed, put to death. Okay? However, the Torah then goes on to say, Lo yumas al pi edechad. You may not execute someone, let's say he's a murderer, based on the testimony of one witness. Stop, listen, and act. I'm going to ask you a question. If you're a Christian and you've been you've been you've been um, injected with the with the abomination of the Trinity, this is the time to reconsider your life. Because Hashem loves you, creating the image of God, but you cannot commit adultery against God and hope that you can have a relationship with God. That's not possible. What does the text say? The text says that upon the, the, the testimony of two or three witnesses, a person can be executed, which is the highest standard. I am not going to get into the complexity, but it's really complicated. The witnesses can't know each other, they're interrogated. But that's not germane. And I'm not going to explain to you why you say two or three, why not four or five. There's actually a reason in Jewish law, not germane. But what does it say? Lo yumas al pi You cannot put something to death based on the testimony of one person. That one witness could be the nicest guy and have the best, most, um, have, have the most uh, s sterling credibility, you just can't. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Does that word echad mean a complex unity, or does it mean one alone and no other? You know the answer. It means one alone and no other. So how do you, you a Christian apologist out there, who devote your life to taking monotheists, meaning Jews and Muslims, and how do you dare utter this filth from your mouth by quoting, by cherry-picking texts where echad means complex unity, ignoring the text. L let me give you another example. So, you know, maybe, 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 uh, 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 this is an exception. Okay, let's turn now to Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. This is the words of Moshe Rabbeinu Olav HaShalom. Who was that? Moshe, Moses, our teacher of blessed memory. You know who Moshe Rabbeinu was? Do you have any idea? Moses heard the voice of God, and he wrote every word as God told him. Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu. Ah! Moshe Rabbeinu writes these words. This is not written by some... Some, some cleaning lady. I, I, I don't mean if you're a cleaning lady, number one. But please, this is the words of, of Moshe, of Moses. He writes these words. Which means that one witness shall not rise up against any man to indict him for any kind of sin. And then it says, I'll be shnei edim. Now, there's the word achav. Does that a compound unity? Now, 
any person knows that's not a compound unity. So here's the question on all these missionaries. How do you dare quote certain passages that conform to your blasphemy and you deliberately expunge all the passages that don't conform to your blasphemy? I'm using blasphemy because it really offends me. How dare you? Do- I mean, now, one con- point again. Most Christians, I find, have no clue. They don't know. This is what their pastor told them. And their pastor is also a nice guy, and their pastor told them the same. So please, if you talk to a Christian, be be more gentle than me, because I I got upset. I don't like this, because now you're dealing with the nature of God, and this is really chicanery. This is not a misunderstanding. The people who use this kind of stuff, not the average, your average Christian. He has no idea. And when you go to him, believe me, it's going to make him think. Okay, um, let's take a look at Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is written by Solomon of blessed memory, who is a prophet. There is one another, not another. This is like going to Las Vegas or in New York. I remember when I was a kid, I don't know if they still do this, they used to have a guy with three card Monty playing on the street corners. And they would move the cards around. And This is all fake. This is a fraud. Now, the, the point here is, I want to now take this a little deeper. There are many, many examples of this. The, the one thing you should do, I hope this is instructive to you, uh, 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 the, and I say this to all those who love HaKadosh Baruch Hu, who loved the Almighty, that you just, what did I do? Did I do magic tricks? All you do is, today, in the old days, you need a concordance and spend 30 bucks. Today it's free. You can go look it up and just look it up. So, um, so I want to first explain this point. The word Echad is a number. It's a number one. It really does operate like in English. I could say that um, I, uh, I don't know, uh, as I said, uh, my whole dinette set, my whole, my, my uh, dinette set, my one dinette set consists of chairs and a table, compound unity. But I can say, uh, I only need one document, not two. It's the same exact thing. What, now, what happens if I want to confuse you? I'll only quote those things that's a compound unity. But I want to... Um, address two other points. If that is the case, and it clearly is, because I've shown you unassailable proof that the word echad, or the number one, can mean either a compound unity or one alone. Now, listen carefully. I want to ask you a question. And it ain't hard, so don't worry. <laughs> I'll get nervous. If what I've told you is true, which clearly it is, then how do you know? How, if, 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 as we see, the number one in the English language can either mean uh, a man and a woman become one flesh, compound unity, or it can mean one witness is not acceptable, but two or three is. Well, how do you know what the word one means in any conversation? What's the obvious answer? The context. If you look at the context, if the text says, and there is, God forbid, that there is one God, but in the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, well, that's a Nicene Creed. Well, that's a compound unity, but that comes out of the Council of Nicene and Constantinople in 325 and 381, respectively. But if, I, if, I, if the context is that there's one and not another, that means one. Now, I'd like to get this a little bit more spiritual, and that is, what is HaKadosh Baruch the Holy One, blessed be His name? What, what, why is He using the word Echad? I mean, what... The Almighty wants us to have this statement, this, the most important creed of the Torah at the forefront of our mind, day and night. When we wake up, this is what we are to think of. When we lie down, this is what we're to think of. When we become, when a child begins to understand, there's the first passage every child learns. When a person is 120 years old and it's time for them to go up to God, this is the last words on the mouth of a person who's ready to face their maker. 
So the question is, like, why is this word used? Now, the reason why this is a compelling question is that if you read Isaiah 43, 42, 44, 45, 46, I'm not just counting here, 48, everywhere it says God is alone and there is no other and he will share his glory with no one. It's everywhere. Why the most central creed don't we, do we have the word echad employed? Why is this holy? This is a, a, the, in a sense, the most intense or numinous or clear way for us to express uh, that there is one Hashem and there's no other. So, Shema Yisrael Hashem Lekein Hashem Echad actually conveys something very, very deep. It conveys many things. I am just on this show because it's such an invaluable question. And this will also tie into your second question. Why, why do we use that word? Like, what, 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 I mean, because in all over the Bible, we're talking about God is alone, there's no other, so why not here? What, what is being conveyed that God is one? And again, the context clearly is not a compound unit because there's no compound, that God is one. But why that language? So here's the answer. The answer is that to a, uh, to a pagan, uh, monotheists don't have a problem, but there is, um, I don't even know if it's a challenge, but uh, let's just call it a challenge. The challenge is the following. We know that the Almighty, blessed be his name, has m many features. For example, the uh, Almighty is um, the, the source of all the powers in the world. I understand why the ancient Greeks thought that there was a god of fire and a god of ice, and there was a god of love and a god of babies, because they they didn't they didn't know any science. It was logical that there was a god of war, there's a god of the water, there's a god of ice, and they're not compatible. Superficial, unless you you really you, now today we know everything's carbon. We know today that an orangutan and a human being are with 98% of our DNA is in common. There has to be one God. But in the ancient world, they didn't know it. They didn't have access to this information. So Judaism in the ancient world was the only monotheism. But to pagans, they're going, are you insane? So therefore, what we are saying when we say, and we're saying many things, I just would like to in convey that the next time in your life that you say these numinous words, think of this. And there are many thoughts, but this is one. When we say echad, in a way, there is a compound unity, but let me explain what I mean. What we're saying is, granted, HaKodesh Baruch is a Rachman. We see God's mercy everywhere. Sometimes we see God's justice. And to our finite mind, justice and mercy seem to be incompatible. But we see in our world that sometimes things go well, what we think is well. How many, by the way, I'll ask you a question. How many things did you hope for and wish for when you were a kid? And it happened, and it turned into the biggest disaster of your life. And how many times did you ask for something and God didn't give it to you, and now looking back in hindsight and retrospect, thank God the Hashem didn't listen to you, because your life would have been over. Okay? Enough said. Everyone knows that. So therefore, what we are saying is that all the powers in the world, that to our limited minds appear different, justice, mercy, and so on, are really all the same, all from God. And that's why the word echad is used. That means we reject the notion that there are multiple independent agencies in the world, but rather everything we see, whether mercy, justice, babies, ice, snow, whatever it is, it's all from one God and no other. That's the key of Deuteronomy 6 4. And for a Muslim, that's the key of Al Bakra uh, verse um, 163. That's so mm, beautiful it is. You see how deep it is, how intimate it is? This is like giving God a hundred thousand kisses. If you understand what I just said, you give Hashem a hundred kisses right now. But what the Christians do, the missionaries do with this, is a crime. 
uh, they can't be locked up because we live in a thing. I think most of them are innocent. Please don't be aggressive with them. Be gentle. They don't know any better. But those who do know are very wicked. And I, do, and I hope, I pray that they repent. Don't, don't. I just pray that they repent. That's all. Uh, now, I'm, this exactly applies to the word, one of the names of God. And that is the name of God. Uh, of now, normally I want to make this point, uh, this point, and that is normally Jews do not say there's one name of God we never mention. It's ineffable. In fact, it's the only sin that God says that if you violate this sin, I'll never forgive you. We have in Deuteronomy 28, 58, be very careful. And then the Ten Commandments says that if you take my name in vain, I will never forgive you. Now, many people say it, but they don't know what they're doing. They're not pronouncing it right, and they don't know any better. They're not held accountable. Now, why is saying God's name in vain such a very serious sin? It is a different conversation, but it's the worst thing. It's the only sin that God says, I will never forgive you. Okay? All right. This is the Third Commandment. Why is, you know, why is it so bad? I actually have a video on this called In the Name of God. You'll find it in YouTube. I don't want to cover it. The key is, but the other names of God, which are found throughout the Torah, Jews say, if we are reciting the whole passage, but we don't use in, we don't just say, God, the other names of God that we say in prayer, in recital, if we're reading the whole passage in the Torah, then we do, but in normally we avoid it. But here, I am I'm permitted to do it because uh, I, I must teach this. Okay, so we're going to talk about the word Elohim, which means God. Now again, I ask you that just don't. I'm using it now to teach Torah, and because it's an urgent issue, because there's a very important question which I'll explain, but normally a Jew doesn't say, no person should say that word unless they're in prayer and they're reading the passage from the Bible. We don't just flippantly, it's, it, we just don't, okay? We say Hashem, the name, that's the word, by the way, used in Deuteronomy 28, Hashem. That's what we say. But here it's important for me to say it. Okay, so here's the argument, and I must cover it. I covered this in my book, Volume 2. But, and I'm not trying to sell books, but if you want all the sources, it's there. Okay, I'm going to play games with you. You know I never ask to buy anything. I don't ask for donations, nothing. But it, it is, I go through all the passages so you can look it up. So the word is, what does the word Elohim mean? This is the name, means God. Okay. Uh, incidentally, because the person called in, his name is Ahmad, which is means that is very likely he's a Muslim. So it operates in the same way in Arabic, because Arabic and Hebrew are extremely close. And I don't have to go on to tell you that that Muslims believe in the God of Avram, and they believe that Yitzhak and Yaakov are prophets. So you have the exact equivalent in Arabic, and that is you have. Ila in Arabic means God. Ila can mean both the true God or a false God. But you can also have the word Allah, which only means the true God. And therefore, a, a, a creed of Islam, the most central core creed of Islam, La ilaha il Allah, which means there is no God. There's Ila, La ilaha il Allah, but the true God. So that means Ila in Arabic and in the Quran could mean both the true God or the false God. It's the same exact way in the Torah. Therefore, you can have the word Elohim as a false God, as the Ten Commandments. Next verse, You have no other gods on my face. And there it's false gods. Same exact thing. What does this word really mean? When we as Jews, or those, we are we who worship the God of Abraham, what are we saying? What are we saying? It's not like God is walking around at a convention. Now you go to a convention and people go, Hi, my name is Tracy. My name is Alan. How do you do, Alan? God's not walking around with a name tag, Allah or Elohim. This is the names that God gave us to use to appreciate who he is. Do you understand that? God is Rahman. It doesn't mean that his name tag, it means he's merciful. Now, what is 
the name Elohim when it's talking about the true God? What does that mean? And the answer is that Al, what does Al mean? Al means power, mighty. In fact, how do you know I'm telling you? Well, anybody who knows Hebrew, who knows Arabic, who knows Semitic, this is, this is kindergarten. But in fact, you'll find in Genesis chapter 1, the very first chapter of the whole Torah HaKadosh, that because God is creating the world, and therefore he is displaying his power, his infinite power, that's the only name of God ever used in Genesis 1. Okay? So you know, uh, this is not... Read Genesis 1. You will not find any other name of God. And there are many, but not in Genesis 1. Why? Because God is displaying what? That all the powers that we see, that seem contradictory. Ice, fire? That's why Pharaoh, when the plague came of hail, and there was fire inside, that's what forced Pharaoh to say, now I see that I'm a sinner and this is the true God. Why did that? Why did Hale convince him? Because in to the Egyptians, fire is one God, ice is another God. How is that compatible? So the moment the Egyptians said, ah, that now that together this is uh, actually we see that 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 uh, that this is only that there's only one God. They they failed anyway, but they this is what convinced them. And therefore, when we use the word Elihim. By the way, Jews normally say Elohim because we don't want in conversation because we don't. I'm doing it now because I want to make sure that people worship one God. I don't want confusion, and for this purpose, I'm permitted to use it. You have to know what we're saying. So first, Elohim, so we have the word Al, which means power, but in Hebrew, in the Holy Tongue, the way you make a plural for a masculine word a, is putting a yud mem at the end, okay? So, uh, uh, ozen means an ear, oznayim, it's masculine, means ears. Um, and therefore, el, al means power, but elohim means powers. That's really what you're saying. Now, let's go a little deeper and really get intimate with God. What are we saying using the word Elohim, and why does this sacred word, again, please do not use this word. I, I'm just asking you. I can't control what you do, but be careful. Don't just throw around God's name. Be careful. Uh, just be careful, okay? It's an entire adult. But here we're going to use it because people's lives are at stake. We're in a hospital, by Shalom, where this is people's lives are at stake, so we have to I, I have to do this here, very care, do this, but don't say that now we can just say it, don't. But here I, I will do it. So what does Elohim mean? Because it ends in a plural. So we have power, and then what we're doing is we're saying all the powers. Oh, now I get it. Elohim doesn't mean that we believe in multiple gods. Spit at that filthy... I'm sorry I get I I just... How could you... It's like someone... You know, curses your your father, your mother. I mean, I, I don't know how not to be offended by this. But what Elohim, in, with a plural at the end, you have to know what the word Al means or Elohim means. It means power. And then when we say Elohim, what we are saying is powers. So what is conveyed by the Jew with Elohim? It's not by the Jew. In the Torah HaKadosh, in the Holy Torah, of, given to us by Moses, our teacher, blessed memory is, what we are conveying in our worship of Hashem is, as we submit to the true God, we're saying that all the powers we see, it's really all from you. That's why it's plural. It's so delicious. It's so geschmack. You just want to just say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me, I love you. But, if, I'll be frank with you, I'm not going to make up stuff. If you don't know the Hebrew, you're a lot of trouble. And I, I say this to everybody. I'm not picking on anybody. I don't know about you. It really blows my mind away. If I got a letter from God... I mean, every day, I presume, you go to your mailbox and you open it up and you see, 
You get like you get a package from Amazon, whoever. Don't you open it right away? Imagine if you got a letter and it said the return address God. Would you open it and read it immediately? And if it was written in a language you don't understand, would you really be satisfied with a translator, or would you give your life? to read a letter, a personal letter from God in its original language. You know the answers. Delicious children of the Almighty. I, 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 I beg you, who, all of you out there, sweethearts, if you believe that Moses is the great teacher, Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher, all of our shalom, a blessed, uh, may peace be upon him, um, a blessed memory. Why don't you study it? Why don't you give your life to study the Hebrew language? No one disagrees that the Torah was written in Hebrew. How, how do you? I, I say it to you just love. Please don't take it personally. I just I, I'm saying this from one person to another. For you who are sincere, you can't go with English translations. I say it to my own kind. I love my congregation. I really do. But I, I give it to them as their rabbi. I say to them, it's one thing if you use a translation a little bit or transliterations to get you through, like someone needs a wheelchair to help them walk or crutches, but the purpose of a wheelchair or a crutch, i.e. a translation or transliteration, is not that you should ride a wheelchair for the rest of your life. The purpose of crutches, and that's what translations are, is that we want to get rid of the crutches and read the original Lashon HaKadosh, the Holy Tongue. And I would just say to me, whatever you do, you do, but I would like to, from the deepest sanctuary of my soul, if you worship the God of Avram, if you believe that Isaac was a prophet of God, if you believe that Yaakov was a prophet of God, yeah, so if you didn't learn Hebrew for whatever reason, Fine. But now you're an adult and you love God. Why would you want to use a wheelchair for the rest of your life? Devote your life to reading the language of God. So you could read it, because that's... If you don't read the language of God, I mean, am I going to lie to you and make up stories? You, how much trouble could you get in? A lot. Anyways, I, I wish all my brothers, my cousins, my dear friends... And all of you who spent the time to study the Hakadosh Baruch Hu Shaat Hachayim Ladam Das, that the Almighty alone is the one who gives wisdom. Pray to God for wisdom to open your heart and to give you understanding. Baruch Ato Hashem Chayim Ladas. The Almighty is the only one who gives wisdom. God is wisdom, as we see in the Book of Proverbs. What that means is not your main. Continue and please God will see the true Mashiach quickly in our time. Thank you so much for joining us with those brilliant questions. אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נסע וחפץ הכל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נסע וחפץ הכל הזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר בתפארה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת עשה וחפץ הכל עשה עם אלך עשה עם אלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו 
ימלוך נורא, והוא היה, והוא עובד, והוא עובד, והוא יהיה בטיפה. אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לב, עשה בחץ הכל הזין מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כתבות הכל לבדו עם הפנורה והוא היה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לב, עשה בחץ הכל הזין מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי כתבות הכל לבדו עם הפנורה והוא היה והוא עובד בתפארה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נסע בחפצה כל הזין מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי תכלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נורא והוא היה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נסע בחפצה כל הזין מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי תכלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נורא והוא היה והוא עובד בתפארה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה והוא היה והוא עובד בתפארה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה 